Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call in the meeting to order. Vice Chair Carter, you have the privilege. Yes. And uh, I know the sheriff is going to speak about something here in just a few minutes, but as we pray this morning, I'd like for us to include one of our deputies who was injured in an accident this weekend, Matthew Jacobson. I understand he's at home and recovering well, but he's going to be, a, he's banged up a little bit. He's going to be a, a while before he's back at work. But uh, join me in prayer, folks. Father God, as we come before you today to do the business of Alamance County, dear Father, we just lift up this board. We lift up the people of Alamance County. We lift up our administration and our staff across the county. But in particular this morning, dear Lord, we lift up Matthew Jacobson, a young man serving our citizens, a young man doing the, the hard job of keeping us safe. And he was injured, fortunately not too severely, in an accident this weekend, and we just lift him and his family Lift the lady that hit him up, dear Lord, and I hope that she's doing well as well. We ask all of you, these prayers, dear Lord, and the power and the grace to do the right thing for our citizens as we proceed in this meeting this morning. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Thank you. Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the agenda, indicate uh, saying by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Be short. Are you, you presenting? I wasn't prepared to, but I can certainly do that if you would like. Is there anything at their seats related to the budget award? As Miss York is approaching, I will ask uh, Jessica Moody and uh, Boland. Alex Norwood, Rebecca uh, Crawford, Susan Evans. And you have to come up and stand. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> Sherry Hook, Bruce Walker, Brian Baker, and Heidi York. All to come forward, please. All right, I do have information I can share. Okay, Would you like me to tell you a little bit about the award? Sure. Uh, absolutely. Okay. This is the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for your fiscal year 24-25 budget document. It represents a significant achievement for those counties that receive this, receives this award. Um, there are guidelines to assess how well an entity's budget serves as a policy document, a financial plan, an operations guide, and a communications device. Um, the budget staff um, has been uh, very involved uh, in order to get this award, and we had last year working on our staff, Jessica Moody, who's still here, Anna Bolin, a budget analyst, Alex Norwood, who's not with us anymore. He was an, an intern with the Association of County Commissioners Association. Of course, Rebecca Crawford, our budget and management services director. Susan Evans, our finance director, Sherry Cook, our deputy county manager, along with Bruce Walker, our assistant county manager, and Brian Baker, assistant county manager. I think I've got everybody. And we have a new staff member on our budget team. Rebecca, would you like to introduce him to the board? Sure. We're here. This is Brent LaFrancis. He is our new budget analyst that started two weeks ago now. Welcome. And he'll be helping us with our next Welcome board. aboard. <laughs> and I'd like for Miss York 
stand just to the left off between these two guys. I'd be happy to do that. We also won this award for our first time last fiscal year. So this is the second consecutive year in a row that the Elements County has been presented with this award. Excellent. And everyone out there in TV land and in, uh, here in person, this is quite an award. Our finances and these folks have done a wonderful job. Uh, keeps us out of trouble <laughs> as commissioners. Uh, and we really appreciate each and every one of you and what you do. Thank you. Indeed. If Thomas, as much as you like finances, this should be the front page of your Thursday edition. Oh, don't tell him now. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, would you like to give us the full amount of money in October just to go over every agenda item just off the top of your head? I can handle all the budget requests. That's what I like. Yes. And Miss Evans, yes, as part of this, not recognition, but just acknowledgement, would you tell us about our last report on tax revenue data sales tax information? Absolutely. Let me pull that up here and give you just one second. So each month, the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners um, will send out preliminary sales tax estimates what um, the county would receive. And right now, so for the month of November collections, we are to receive $3.6 million, which is a small increase of about $60,000 compared to where we were with November 23 collections. So um, that would be an increase of 1.66%. Ours is slightly above the state increase, which was 0.023%. Um, a lot of that has to do with the market that we have with Alamance Crossing, Tanger, as well as University Commons. So when the sales tax increases slightly above in the state, we normally and typically see a higher increase. But then the same is true also if there's a decline in that sales tax collections, we see a deeper decrease because of customer spending. Um, so right now we are at about 1% ahead of where we were in December of 2023. And about one and a quarter percent above the state average. That's correct. We're about one and a half percent above the state average. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that reflects the impact of inflation on our constituents. I mean, if you're, you're having to spend more for groceries and gas, you're spending less which we get groceries and gas, we don't get correct the same level of sales tax. So right. we get no sales tax on the uh, uh, gas. We get a gasoline the gasoline tax goes to the state. So we get caught in that situation. Mm -hmm. Our citizens have less money to spend. They spend it on necessities. So we see a reduction in the consumer sales. Correct. Um, can I ask if does anyone know the status of um, Alamance Crossing? I had read in the paper, I think the Elements News, that a section of that place had been sold. But yet I'm seeing new things being built over there, which is a great sign. So I didn't know that's such a biggie for our county. Okay. Hmm. Quick question, Ms. Evans. Where is yes. the um, sales tax as compared to budget? Um, so we are we are about 24.93% of the budget collected. So we're on target because on target. we would have received right now through November, that would have been three months worth mm -hmm. of sales tax. So for the first quarter, we are on target um, with our sales tax budget and projections. If the board will remember when we were going through the fiscal year 24-25 budget, we looked at our trends. Where were we going? We did not assume a a significant increase in those sales tax revenues 
we held them pretty much flat, and in one article, we actually reduced that budgeted amount. Right. So right now, we are on target to at least meet budget. Thank you. Excellent. Stuff. Mm -hmm. So we get a <coughs> A plus on our finance indicators, and at least an A on sales tax improvement. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, we only have one public speaker. Nobody will guess who it would be, and nobody knows him, Terry Johnson. <laughs> All I want to do is come for you, commissioners, and tell you what a fantastic job our EMS done with our deputy that was T-boned at 50 miles an hour in the side, transported to Duke. He was released yesterday. He's at home. He's beat up pretty bad. But our EMS people did an outstanding job, and I hope you don't forget that. That's the type of service they're providing for our citizens, and they did for our officer. Our officer is in uh, probably decent shape, bruised up pretty bad about the head and face and stuff, and uh, hurting in his ribs. I went to the hospital that evening to see him, and uh, of course they were working on him, but our people did an outstanding job. I'm not talking about my people, I'm talking about EMS. And I want them to know that, and I want y'all to know that. I was very proud. Thank well, I saw Thank some you. pictures of the accident online. I understand you had some too this morning, but you're not going to share them with us today. We, lost, we totally lost the car. Uh, both cars were totally lost. But uh, I will say this, had he been in a Dodge Charger, he would probably be dead. That big frame in the uh, Durango. Durango probably saved his life in the airbags. How about the uh, other driver? Uh, they were uh, hurt a little bit, not bad. They were, I think, three people in that car, and uh, they they transported them to the hospital for observation. We'd like for it to be known that the officer was the victim. He was not at fault. Oh, uh, someone ran a stop sign. At 50 miles, about 50 miles an hour. Yeah. And uh, we, there was an eyewitness. To... Thank you. Thank, Thank you. <coughs> Next is our consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, actually, two seconds. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, Miss Crawford. Good morning. Good morning. Our next agenda item is Budget Amendment 5. We do have a few items where we are adding additional appropriation, and I'll go through them briefly. And then we are also requesting a final reallocation of our ARPA funding in preparation for that December 31st deadline. Our first uh, two items will impact the general fund. That would be an additional award of $140,113. Uh, and that is for the transportation department. We will have funds for the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Assistance Program, or EDTAP, Employment Transportation Assistance Program, or EMPL, and the Rural General Public Program, RGP. Uh, this requires a 10% match. However, that will be provided through active fare revenue with no batch in county general funds. Our next item is a $15,000 grant that was awarded from Camp Hope America, North Carolina to the Family Justice Center. Uh, the funds will be used solely for Camp Hope related program expenses, such as program fees, supplies, affiliation fees, and travel related expenses. Uh, this grant does not require a county match. Next, we have our final reallocation for the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Uh, our county manager has set a goal to fully obligate and potentially expend these funds by the December 31st, 2024 deadline. So that's why we're bringing this item to you today. We did have a couple of items we brought to you in a most recent amendment uh, to supplant funds for 
the purchase of replacement ambulances, paramedic vehicles, and ambulance remounts. However, we found that while those purchases did meet state and local procurement guidelines, they did not meet that higher level of federal procurement guidelines. So all legal, all wonderful, but did not meet that higher level to be eligible for ARPA supplanting. So we have recommended that we further supplant EMS salaries and fringe from FY23-24, which would put those expenses that have already been incurred to be funded by ARPA rather than county general fund. We had one other change uh, to a previously reviewed and approved amendment, which was $450,500, which we're going to be spent towards the ACC Public Safety Training Center for water and sewer adjustments. Uh, we recently put out an RFP, received no bidders, and while we feel like this is an important project and want to move forward, it will most likely more, be more expedient to supplant those funds with county general funds and then increase the existing ACC capital project for the Public Safety Center. Uh, if you have any questions about that, let me know. I think that's a, a little bit confusing, but we want to move forward with the project by adding it to the existing project that ACC is performing. Uh, we, you, go ahead. Sure. <coughs> go ahead, Sam. We originally allocated 500000 for that water project. Yes. And we for installing uh, uh, high-speed internet to it as well. And it's, when I know we that lost. That we, when did that happen? I think it was just a water line extension. I don't think it was related to any well, broadband. back before you were on the board, Pam. Um, Evidently. Um, is that a separate project? The original intent, the way it was specified with ARPA funds, was purely for water and sewer. Okay. And we did expend 49500 in the original scoping of the project and design. Um, but we'll need to reallocate the rest of it that was unable okay. to be spent in the actual performing of the project. Steve, the internet part was, AT&T was already in the area and they already had high speed, so that was not, Okay. they did not have to extend the line, so they just put all of it toward the water. I remember that. Okay. Um, would you rather me to wait when you're finished? Because I have a few questions. Sure, I'm project. almost finished if okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then there are a final few reallocations where we have fully spent out the project and had remaining funds and then reallocated them to make sure that our budget matched our actuals. And let's see. Oh, one of our last one was the mobile radio replacement. We received additional E911 funds to support some of those mobile radios <coughs> and did not need the full 4.8 million uh, for those radios. And so we're able to reallocate that last 83,000. Commissioner okay. Thompson. Go right back to the EMS. They okay. With, I remember when we voted on this to use all that money to help them with some bus replacement, all kind of stuff. Are you telling me that's not gonna happen or just a, a certain part of it? So those, uh, those uh, ambulances and paramedic vehicles were already purchased. Okay. So those are done deal and they have them and are using them or the ambulances are in the progress of being purchased. So EMS is getting all of the materials that we wanted them to get. This is just swapping out the funding source. Okay, and one more thing. Um, I went out to the training center last week and spoke to someone there um, and got to see all these blueprints. I'm gonna tell you, whoever does blueprints is a genius. They're, they're <laughs> in a cubicle hid in the basement somewhere because that's all they do. Um, but when I seen the line from 49 down Sandy Crossroads, I mean, it's just like multiplied and stuff out there. It's amazing how it was when we went there for ribbon cutting. Um, I asked him, I said, that doesn't look like $500,000 is going to cover that. I don't know anything about it, but I know mm -hmm. it never does what you want it to do. And um, this person had mentioned it would be more expensive, and I, and I had a feeling. But I asked them about this fire tower, and I wanted to know about certain kind of fire tower because we heard, I mean, the reason that I was not against the project but against it in a sense to vote on it, the increased amount of how much it's going to cost, was the water pressure with the county, the town and couldn't provide that when it come to a fire tower and firemen having hoses and putting this out. Well, I'm informed that they won't be able to do that anyway because of the kind of tower it is, water don't work with that. And that was being suggested that that tower might be turned into training for special forces, that kind of thing with law enforcement. 
And then I was told, I made a call about it, that ACC is working with the city of Burlington to build a fire tower at their place on Quarry Road back in behind Living Free so that they can put out fires on a real tower to build that to, for that training, which I understand. So why would we need to build a fire tower at this training center if it's not going to be designed to put out fire for firemen? We can certainly follow up on that question and see if we can come back to you with more information. This particular funding source was for the water and sewer piece of right. it, but we'll, that, we can but make sure we come back I to you with a response. I understand how things get built, yeah. and maybe they might not should have as far as what they were supposed to be to start with, because this training center was supposed to be like a family justice center encompassing all first responders to make sure everybody, one giant team, is there getting the best of the best when it comes to training facilities. And I know fire is not going to be able to do that with a tower there. It's a whole different kind of situation. So I'm, I'm just asking questions because it's, um, it's just a lot of money, and I just want to make sure that every part of first responders is equal and they're getting what they, they think they're going to be getting. That's the point. Because um, if they're going to be staying over at Burlington, I have to wonder. So it's just um, I just want to make sure that every first responder is is all the same. I think I can actually answer that question okay. for you. I, as you know, I serve on the Board of Trustees and I'm also on the Building and Grounds Committee. The problem with the fire tower was the water pressure. The right. dirty, the, there are two different kinds of fire towers, a clean fire tower and a dirty fire tower. The dirty fire tower actually has b burns in it that you actually put out. Right. They didn't have water pressure sufficient to retain and sustain the amount of pressure they'd need to run that multiple times during the day. That's the reason for relocating the dirty burn tower to the fire training center for Burlington. It's about eight minutes away from the, the site in uh, Green Level. The clean burn tower can be used for multiple purposes. It's not only used for possibly special forces. I hadn't heard anybody at the college say that yet, but um, law enforcement training, both in a smoky environment. I mean, it, it creates smoke and things like that so that you're trained to go in and get it, either deal with people in it or something of that nature that try and extract somebody if there's a somebody that's caught in an environment or to, to deal with it as law enforcement might have to deal with clearing a building. And so it's a different building, different purpose, but it's all related to public safety training. So you gotta have two. One that you could the put original out the water, plan, the but original you couldn't plan do was water to have where it's being built because right. of pressure. And you're going to have this one to practice. That's the original plan money. was for two on the same I hadn't location. Heard, I wasn't told. Oh, well, he had never heard of it. <coughs> the original plan was for two towers in the same location one clean, one dirty. The dirty one's going over at Burlington. Okay. It might indicate that the tower at the safety center would be used by law enforcement, uh, firemen, and emergency services. Right, EMTs. So it's um, EMTs. So it's a multi-purpose and is very, very necessary. Well, is this additional tower, what I was told, just a little shy of a million dollars, is that coming out of your bond, ACC's yes. bond? Mm -hmm. Okay. They're not done. I thought they were about done with their money. Or is that premium, surprise premium part? There's no additional funds being required. So the, the project that we're paying for right now, we have already sold the bonds for right. and are using the cash proceeds for that. There is still a small amount, yes, due to accepting premium, that we have a bond par amount that has been authorized, but it has not been issued. So that's more debt when it's issued? If the county were to choose to issue that, yes. Okay. All right, that's all. I'm going to make the motion that we approve this. I Do I have a second? I got one question as well. Uh, I I have I'll give you a second, but I go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, okay. go ahead. All right. Thank, thank you. Ms. Crawford, um, I just want to make sure I understand. The um, the supplanting funds and the and the ambulances, uh, we had, we had decided to use ARPA funds to, to supplant money that we'd spent on ambulances. We can't use it for that. So we're supplanting different funds that the county already is obligated to pay. So it's a zero dollar impact on the general fund. That is correct. Okay. The money, the $450,000 for the water sewer to green level for the uh, ACC training center is still going for that purpose. 
Um, so that's that's as planned. That's We're correct. Just allocating it at this point. That's correct. And so the only thing that could be a budget, a general fund impact in this request could be, is the matching funds for the transportation grant. But <coughs> active fees are paying for that. <coughs> again, there's a zero general fund impact for that. Yes, I will okay. give just a little bit of caveat. Okay. So when we supplant the general funds with ARPA for the emergency medical services salary and fringe, that then frees up county general funds. And we are proposing in the next item to transfer 450,500 of the freed up, so general funds that were put into place because of that ARPA supplantation. Uh, to the Alamance County Capital Projects Fund. So yes, there is a net zero there, and we're well, just moving it. Yeah, but we're, but haven't we already planned to use? I mean, Did, we're already going to supplant money for um, ambulances. So why is it why is it free up money if we were already going to use that money somewhere else? I think that is a very good point. There, we're just swapping it. So we were we're already going to have extra money anyway. That's correct. And this puts it to the capital fund. That's correct. <clears throat> Is there any um, is there any concern about using that the capital fund rather than holding on to it in this budget cycle to make sure we don't need it for something else? We have other supplanted county general funds that are uh, we have um, highlighted for other purposes, such as the courthouse. I mean, I think that we we will ha continue to have additional supplanted funds, and we can bring that back to you what that total will be after we make this amendment, if that's helpful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our last item would be for the health department. Uh, they were awarded $900,000 in federal funding from the Department of Justice uh, for a grant to reduce crime and recidivism adult treatment court program. This will be a uh, four year term from October 1st of 24 to September 30th of 28. And the funds will be used to target high risk, high need, nonviolent individuals, who are post adjudication and whose low level felonies and misdemeanors are directly or indirectly motivated by drug and or alcohol use. The goal is to serve 150 individuals over the life of the grant. And funds will be used for contract services, educational supplies, and training expenses. And that is all of our budget amendment five. And I included in my motion all of that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you did in your second, I understand. Hey, Susan, can I ask you? Sure. Oh, Bill, go ahead, because you are asked. Oh, I was just going to, uh, Commissioner Turner, thank you for those two questions, because you, you, you landed on my two questions once again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for the answers. Uh, my one last question that I had, in, in addition to uh, Commissioner Turner, what do what what do we do about because uh, this is the first time I've ever heard that we actually submitted a uh, you know RFP and didn't get any response. It's been a what, while. What choices do we have? I mean, um, I'm just curious. What, what choices do we have? I, in terms of procurement, I think uh, Mr. Baker might have some more information on that particular RFP. Um, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I, it's, it's pretty unusual mm -hmm. for us to not get any bids on a project. It happens, and we just put it out again. Um, when you have to put it out a second time, it does sort of indicate to uh, the bidders that, hey, we're on the edge of desperation here. Uh, so we don't love that. Um, and that was one hesitation we had to do in that again this time. Is our budget on this project is tight? It's um, tight. It's tight, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, with the escalation of everything, I'm just not sure there's going to be enough money in there. Um, so we were kind of already on the edge and said, we don't want to put this back out for one bidder. To, and, and the ARPA rules are a little more stringent than your normal rules. So they required that we have three bidders and we didn't get any bidders. So it just felt like it was going to be a long delay to get to where we had somebody to work on that project. Um, so the way to get this done without holding up the entire project was to let ACC go through their processes. It's, it's not ARPA money. It doesn't have as stringent requirements on how they spend it. So it's a little more flexibility, and this is the way to get this project done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, what is the balance of all this ARPA money that we've got? Because you're talking about the end of December. That has to be done. Bear with me just one. No, take your time. I doubt that's just, like, right there. <laughs> oh, okay. Get you 
while you're looking, does that mean, Mr. Baker, we're going to have to keep adding money to get that done? So we've indicated to ACC that this is the amount of money we have allocated and that I've not had any discussions with you guys about more. So they can figure it out or they can come up and talk to you guys again. So uh, one way or the other, we're going to pay for it. I, I, I don't know what their financial situation is as on a project as a whole. Okay. Maybe they can reallocate money from another part of the project that they have funding left over. Um, we're just giving them the money you guys allocate to them and say, here you go. We have spent $25.8 million. So with this budget amendment, we will be appropriating the, the rest of the $5 million and then transferring what we need to to the general fund so that according to U.S. Treasury guidelines, the funds are spent. And then by supplanting expenditures in the general fund, we can then use those monies for another purpose. When you say the rest of it, any idea what that figure is? $5 million. Just $5 million? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, thank you. And the whole exercise here is to make sure that everything is allocated before the last day of December. That's correct. That's correct. And then we have about an additional year to Two get years. it spent. Two years. Excellent. To get it spent. But we are on track to yeah. fully spend way before that. Yes. Excellent. Which is a huge accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Did you just say that we're on track to spend way more than that? No, um, more, faster. Okay, because she had a big old Sooner smile on her face, years. I thought. <laughs> you have this bucket that we don't know about. No, no, no. Okay, faster. thank you. Sorry. Faster than the deadline. No problem. Mm -hmm. Board members, any other questions? Here we have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. You don't look like Carmen to me. <laughs> Tony, we Not. know who you are. Would you announce sure. yourself, please, sir? Good morning, Commissioners. Tony Lodidice, Health Director. Uh, here to present to you some session law changes regarding the community child protection teams and child fatality prevention teams that occurred over the past year. And uh, at the end of the presentation, we respectfully request board action. Thank you, sir. Yep. So just kind of have a high level. Um, session law 2023-134 made some changes to the CFPT and the CCPT teams. Um, at the state level, it directed the Health and Human Service mm -hmm. to establish a new office for child uh, fatality prevention. And it directs a comprehensive restructuring of child fatality review systems statewide. At the local level, it merges the two teams into one unified local team for each county. And then additionally, um, which we'll be asking at the end, um, state law requires commissioners to determine whether the local team will proceed as a single county team or a multiple county team before January 1st, 2025, and I'll be making a recommendation. So just a little bit about what the CCPT and CFPT teams are. So the local community child protection team um, identify and respond to gaps in the county's child prevention protection response, it reviews active cases where abuse, neglect, and dependency are found, reviews fatalities where abuse and neglect or known protective services, um, reports to the Board of County Commissioners, the community, and does an annual report. And then the local child fatality prevention team reviews child fatalities. They do a robust review uh, going through medical examiner reports, death transcripts, police reports, and other records. And they provide an annual report both to the Board of Health and the county commissioners. This is the makeup of the team. I won't uh, read through every one, but for the most part, it's, it's DSS, it's law enforcement, it's emergency service personnel, court personnel, uh, consumers of, of care, um, and a whole host of other providers. Um, at the bottom there, you'll see an asterisk. This is five additional community members selected by co-chairs. Prior to the session loss change, these five members were selected by the Board of County Commissioners, so there's a change there. Um, all other selections by the County Commissioners, so the firefighter, uh, the law enforcement personnel, and the parent of a child who died before reaching their 18th birthday will still be selected by the County Commissioners um, when those positions open up. Let me ask you this. I, I know that we have to appoint those. It also talks about five additional positions. Uh, so we have how many? 
that we would offer us. So those, those five additional positions, there was a shift. So previously it was the board, now it's gonna shift to the co-chairs of those two teams. They'll actually be selecting those five. Thank you. So that's one of those changes there. Um, so before you, obviously I mentioned earlier that the board must select um, from two options by January 1st, 2025. And I'm gonna give um, the potential benefits and challenges to both options so commissioners can see the whole comprehensive picture of this. The first option is a multi-county team, so meaning it would be Alamance County maybe working with Guilford and Chatham and so on and so forth. Um, so some potential benefits there is shared resources across counties, um, may support cross-county collaboration, and may increase the quality of reviews that involve child living in multiple counties in the area. Challenges regard to option one are com complex decisions of staffing and leadership responsibilities among multiple counties, really who will do what, who's in charge of what, how's that going to occur. So that wasn't really spelled out in the statute, so there's gotta be a lot of work that has to be done there. Allocation of funding, we do get a small amount of funding. I can speak on public health part, um, around $1,400 a year. There is a pretty costly administrative burden because you have to pull, someone's gotta pull a lot of records um, for these cases, they are very complex. Um, so who would that allocation go to? Who gets the funds to make that happen? Scheduling an agreement to participate among the multi-county leaders. So um, scheduling could be very good. The, just the logis simple logistics of it, travel, and the sheer volume of reviews. Option two for a single county team. Um, benefits are we already have a robust team in place. We establish resources. <coughs> I guess and you need to go to that slide so you can see it. Establish resources and community partnership, making it more practical for a local system change. And reviews are local and focus on the local systems. One of the challenges is team burnout and mental health. I can tell you for the folks that are reviewing these, um, they're basically reliving these experiences, or maybe reliving these experiences one again from the child fatality. So it is very emotional um, to sit through these and have to go step by step on the child's death. Um, and so, but the co-chairs do a very good job at uh, doing some type of debrief at the end and kind of um, removing that stress once they go through there. So those are the two options before you. Um, and the recommendation from Candace and I is that we support a single county team. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and what we'd be looking for is a vote for either a single county team or a multiple county team. Ms. Thompson. I have a question. Has, is anybody, I was on the Child Fatality Task Force, the state one, intentional deaths, murder and suicide of children up to 18. And um, Chatham County's DSS director was one of our co-chairs. And I'm just curious, is there anybody, I'm not on it now, is there anybody from Alamance County that sits on this state task force? Not that I'm aware of. No. Man, you, you, I can't highly suggest you apply somebody, because either one of you would be amazing and somebody else, would, to sit on that because of all this, all the options across the whole state and the state leaders that are on that, I mean, I remember a special NICU pediatri pediatrician that only dealt with heroin addicted newborns. Golly, and the, some of the things, I mean, you know, you supposed to need a reality shot, but I, I just think the more our county can get involved and just have that foot in the door that can bring this back to our counties even better because you guys would be a great addition to that. So um, that's it. And before you step down, I would like for you, Tony, to tell us how much you enjoy Camp Hope because you talked to me in a car <laughs> at Camp Hope on a Zoom. So I just know that really impressed you and I'd love to hear you say something about that. Sure, Camp Hope was awesome to get to work with all those kiddos and the camp counselors and Sky and her group did a wonderful job putting Camp Hope together. And um, we um, also had a, a nurse with us from the health department that, that joined us and she was busy. When I say busy, she was around the clock. Um, but did a wonderful job working with those kiddos. But it was very memorable. Um, it was an exciting time during the summer, and I can't wait till next year's camp to be able to do it again. So and it's a great opportunity. And it doesn't there. stop at camp. It does, no. just doesn't stop at the camp, right? Um, there, there's stuff that occurs after that. I just had the trunk or treat that Sky did last week at the uh, FJC, which was an awesome event um, to see all those kiddos smiling and, and getting out to give out candy. So it was just a great event overall. Well, and yeah. while I'm here, this is totally like a rabbit going in a hole. Thank you for the DV candlelight visual. And this year, I think I heard more murder suicides than I've ever heard in one year. And I, it was just, it was very, very special. We'll, 
Yeah, it just never ends. So that that's it. But y'all, please think about that. It would be great for the county yep, to absolutely. have somebody on that task force. Mr. Lashley. No, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Tony, how many children do are uh, do you normally? Um, come encounter with in this particular sure for child ch um, child fatality review um, doing this by memory I might be off okay. a little bit but um, 2021 it was about 26 children that we reviewed um, 2022 um, was somewhere around 20 and then the year after that was 15 um, so and then we're waiting for the next year to, to get the final record. So it, t it takes a while once sure. autopsies are done to medical records. So there's usually a lag, but and then it appears to be a, a, a long list of things that you. I mean, it's not just it's, it's not just death of the child. It's yeah. other other things as well. Yeah, it, it, the whole idea behind this is to look at the system, right? How many touch points were right. there? Um, were all the touch points appropriate? Was there, is there a gray area? Is there a gap that we need to shore up? So it's very intense. It's step by step. And like I said, it's very heavy um, and dense and deep. And, and, and um, it, But uh, that's the whole purpose of it. And we've identified, I went for the Board of Health, there was a few recommendations that came out last mm -hmm. year's report that we, that we pushed up to the state. So um, I saw that you are recommending the single county um, that doesn't preclude you or doesn't keep you from talking to other counties? Absolutely not. Yeah, we always have the option talking down at other counties. And if something that occurred in another, so if it was part of a review mm -hmm. and there was some cross county there, we would absolutely try to get those records, bring them in and be able to review and have those conversations with, might be another county health department, Excellent. another county DSS or count, another county law enforcement, whatever that might be. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Nothing for me, thank you. Mr. Carter. I think he's answered all my questions. Tell me about county funding. Sure. So I'll speak on the health department and I'll let um, Candace talk about the DSS, but we receive an agreement addendum to our master agreement each year. Um, and that AA is usually around anywhere from 1400 to 24 hundred dollars. And that's really to just pick up the administrative piece of that. So we hire a contract administrative assistant to help coordinate the meetings, get the records. So it's a lot of records requests and really coordinate all that. Do we spend all that money? Absolutely. And probably then some, like I said, it's very administratively dense and takes a good amount of time for that to occur. I'll say DSS does not receive any additional funding for the CCPT side. Um, all of that is sent over to the health department, which will continue with this new model of merging the teams. That funding will continue to be streamlined through the health department. And is the funding adequate? <clears throat> we could always use more. <laughs> <laughs> but we answer. make do with what we have. <laughs> Thank you. I, got, I do have one other question. How often do, does this organization or this group meet? Yeah, so um, it is done. So four meetings a year for both teams. So that's eight, eight months out of the year they meet. Um, so and that will actually decrease a little bit as both teams merge. So really, have, you have both teams, and it just makes sense from an efficiency standard just to bring right. them together and get on a consistent meeting schedule and be able to review those. I think the statute only requires two meetings. But Correct, a minimum of two. You could do more than two more. if need be. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you seeing any um, child deaths with um, fentanyl in the house that they've come across, I'm which is all it takes sometimes? Sure. Um, I'm not saying there isn't. I'm not saying there's not. Yeah. I just don't recall it. This, I know this we hear that all yeah. the time. Yeah. Hmm. More to any other questions? If not, I'll make a motion for the single County. as opposed to the multi. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next item, I guess, is... Uh, Sarah Towns and the Baker Tilly folks. Good morning, everyone. 
Nice to see you all again. Uh, my name is Sarah Town. I'm the consulting manager with our classification compensation team at Baker Tilly. Excited to present uh, the results from our second phase of the market study uh, in conjunction with HR. Um, and so I want to be able to walk through our methodology, have an opportunity for you all to answer or ask us questions, um, as well as then the results of what we've done as part of phase two of the market. So there are a lot of items that go into determining compensation for employees. It starts very broad and big, which is your compensation philosophy, defining who is your market and what is your position in market. Organizations will take a lead, a lag, or a match philosophy. The current compensation philosophy for Alamance County is match. Is so as we look at the market and determine those peer organizations, our goal is to match at 100% at the midpoints or that what they're doing in terms of average salaries. There is hope that we could potentially lead in the future. Um, and so right now, as we work through the three phases of the market study, we're taking a match compensation philosophy. From there, we move into the external competitiveness component. That's looking organization to organization. So how other counties and local municipalities, um, as defined by Alamance County, who those peer organizations are, and what their base rate of pay is for the various positions that we're looking at year over year. From there, we also look at determinants of compensation in terms of internal consistency and the individual contributions. So what the actual employee brings to the role, their skills, their seniority, their performance, all of those components. A reminder that the market study is just looking at external competitiveness. So we are not looking at people in the roles, not looking at evaluating performance or any of those components. It is staying squarely focused on the external competitiveness of Alamance County's salaries. Maybe. How do I move forward? It's not. Going. It's not. Right. Thank you. So a reminder of our four-phase process that we work through as part of this study. It starts with data collection. We look at uh, understanding what is the current state in 2024 for Alamance County. Um, any adjustments that we made from last year to this year in terms of position movement within the overall compensation structure. Then we're out to market, looking again at a third of the positions. I'll get into more what our market assessment focused on. We're using the results of the market assessment, we made adjustments to the pay plan, as well as the position grade assignments. And we're here now, final report, final presentation, and handing everything back over to the county for moving forward. So in our market assessment, we work with the county to identify 15 peer organizations. These are comparable and competitive peer organizations. These are similar to the organizations we used last year. We want some consistency year over year. And so we are looking at the positions that may be relative in size comparable. So they may have similar revenue, population served, um, number of employees. We want to make sure that they have the same and similar services that you're offering as well. They're organizations that may be geographically close to you, but I liken the best peer organization to the movement of employees within the market space. So who you're losing talent to, who you're gaining them from, that's the best indicator of a peer organization. Each year we take a third of the positions in the entire county to market. So this year was the second third of positions, 118 positions in total. And once all of that data comes back from the peer organizations, we do make some adjustments to the data. So something like work week. If another organization is on a 37 five hour work week, we wanna make sure that those annualized rates are comparable. We age the data if it's not for the current fiscal year. And then we also look at a geographic cost of labor adjustment. But most importantly, we don't weight the data. It's a law of averages that we're working on here. So we have 15 peer organizations plus our three published salary sources, total 18 matches. We're looking at what are the average salaries of these positions based on those 18 entities. And then we also have a pretty rigorous quality control process. So this is not just title for title, what it, they're paying the positions. We wanna make sure that your positions are looking and working like their positions. So we're actually diving into the duties and responsibilities. We review job descriptions. What do your current job descriptions say? <coughs> what do their job descriptions say? Just because they both say specialist doesn't mean they look and work the same. They may have different minimum qualifications. So we have a pretty rigorous quality control process, making sure that 
we have a quality amount of matches. And then we also have to look at the significant number of matches. I know that there are uh, uh, parts of the county that want to compare themselves to just one or two entities, um, but we have to have a threshold of at least three to be able to calculate market value. Kind of hard to say this is the market when you only have one other data point. That's not the market, that's you against one peer. So we want to make sure that we have a significant number of those quality matches as well. These were the 15 public peer organizations to be included in this study. We were able to collect and compile data from all 15 of those. And then we have our three published salary sources. So those are our Bureau of Labor Statistics, Comp Analyst, and the Economic Research Institute. Those are going to represent the private sector in our data set as well. So we have skilled laborer positions, um, administrative support positions. We have positions that are in competition for talent with the private sector. Those are included. But the majority of the data is coming from the public peer organizations. A little bit more on that adjustment that we make to the data. So one of the components that we look at is cost of labor. It's not the same thing as cost of living, though it's taken into account. So cost of living is that measurement of goods and services in a given geographic area. It's housing, it's medical, it's, it's goods and services. Um, but what we're looking at is the cost of labor or the amount of compensation in a given geographic area on average. And it's impacted by cost of living. There's an additional premium put on salaries for places with higher cost of living. Um, but what this is really influenced by is that rate of unemployment the number of qualified laborers to fill vacant positions. And this data comes from the Economic Research Institute, allows us to drill into a specific geographic area, determine what is that cost of labor. So for we do this every single year. So Alamance County's cost of labor for this year is 92.3. That's off of a scale of 100. So you actually take Alamance County versus Alamance versus Guilford versus... Exactly. Yep. So we take that same indicator for each of the peer organizations. So we start with what is the cost of labor in Alamance County? And then what is that cost of labor in Durham, in Wake, in Guilford? We look at all of them and then we know and understand how much to adjust the data either up or down by because they have a higher cost of living, higher cost of labor. So this is the adjustments that we make to the data. Overall, the majority of the organizations, there's only about four of them that are being adjusted more than 10%. Um, but this is not indicative of what they're actually paying their employees as well. So this is just looking at cost of labor and how compensation changes year over year. Some organizations are better about keeping pace with the cost of labor as it moves um, year to year. So this is what's helpful to be able to understand how you compare. We want to make sure it's a good apples to apples comparison, not making any adjustments um, or taking into consideration that cost of labor. Cost of labor. Question. Sure. I notice there's a pretty high adjustment there for Chatham. Curious, do, is it, do we have any insight into what's driving that for Chatham County compared when the other three appeared to be Orange, uh, Durham, and Guilford, I think. Um. Yeah, so what one, one of the things that we look at is just what that influx is in terms of growth rates within the, the area. So if there is a high percentage of growth rates, but also they're matching unemployment or they're reducing unemployment, some of this is driven by the private sector as well. It's not solely driven by public sector. Um, occurring within that part of the world. And so when we look at these geographic entities and we're saying what's happening in Pittsburgh or what's happening right now in terms of those growth, um, this is looking at how the compensation changes year over year. So this is all based off of a scale of 100, the United States average being 100. So right now if we're looking at Orange County, um, Hillsborough right now has 104.3 cost of labor. That means they're 4.3% higher than the United States national average of their cost of labor. That's likely due to their growth just within the past year or two. Any other questions? Observation. Sure. If you look at each one of these, Orange County, Chatham County, just go through the list of the multi-Durham County, they're all some of our highest taxed counties. Therefore, the high taxes actually increase the labor cost. Simple as that. It's a good just observation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. 
So moving into our market results, again, I mentioned that we carried 118 positions or 33% of the positions into the market this, this go round as benchmark positions. We were able to obtain market values for 94.1% of them, which is great because we want to be able to, our best practice says we need to calculate at least 50% to be able to adjust salary structures. So we're well above that threshold here. Great market data. Again, this go around, peers very active in sharing their data. So shout out to your peer organizations for being uh, transparent in their data as well. Um, but we also then prepare a variety of reports. We look at the average minimum, average midpoint, and average maximum of those peer organizations with sufficient data. While we look at the full range, we want to make sure that your minimums are competitive. Starting salaries, you're able to draw talent into the organization, but we also don't want you to become a training ground to where um, you train them in and then they leave for another entity. So we look at the full range, what's occurring at the midpoints, what's occurring at the maximum as well. And on average, looking at these 111 positions with sufficient data, the county right now is 4.2% above market at the minimum, 1.8% above market at the midpoint, and 0.1% really at, above market at the maximum. And what this is indicating is that we're more competitive at the minimums right now, but we still have some work to do. But overall, as we adjusted and recalibrated everything last year, we're still taking that match market philosophy. We're looking really competitive. I'll caveat that with this is on average of the 111 positions that we looked at. This is not indicating that all of your positions right now are competitive. Some positions need adjustment been a while since we've reviewed them in market, so this is what the market study is used to determine. We want to make sure that all of the positions in the county are market competitive, which is then where we take that market assessment data and we move into pay plan design and development. We're going to use that existing pay plan that we used last year, make recommendations for adjustment, and then we go line by line, position by position to determine the correct grade assignment. So we review 362 positions every single year. And then we look at then the implementation as well. Once the grade assignments are determined, we look at then where people are at within these ranges and prepare some cost implementation scenarios. So this is the current pay plan that Baker Tilly uh, proposed and was adopted last year. It's an open range pay plan, meaning it's open from minimum to maximum. Employee salaries could fall somewhere between those ranges. And then we also have 37 grades. They're numbered 100 through 136 right now. We have a tailored range spread. The range spread is that distance from minimum to maximum. And that's tailored to match the learning curve of the positions. Shorter distance for positions that could get up to speed quickly. Larger range spreads for positions that may need more time as they have supervisory responsibilities, a variety of tasks, that learning curve is a little bit wider. Right now, the starting minimum wage is $14.44 an hour. That equates to a $30,042 uh, a year annual salary. And so what we take is then, what is the market telling us in terms of adjustments that we need to make to this current pay plan? And we move into our proposed general pay plan. So when we say that uh, our goal is to have Alamance County match at market or taking a match market philosophy, what we're talking about is this midpoint, which is why I've highlighted that column. Midpoint represents when somebody is fully proficient in the role, not just meeting the minimum qualifications coming at entry level, but what is that midpoint or market value for their positions. So we look at all of the positions that are in grade 100, and on average, what is their market value? That's what we align to the market. We use a regression analysis to help us understand what is that distance between each grade and how to keep those range spreads competitive. Based on our adjustments, the starting minimum wage would increase to $14.54 an hour, overall equating to an annual salary of $30,250. So like I mentioned, once we have the adjustments to the overall pay structure, we go line by line, position by position to determine grade assignments. This is because positions move at different rates in the market. Some positions are really hot jobs right now. They're really competitive. So we need to make sure that we're competitive as well. Others, 
move up consistently, and so they're already appropriately placed. So if we just shift everything by a set percentage, it's going to overcorrect for some positions and undercorrect for others. This is why we go line by line, position by position. So this is a sample of the market data from this year as we look at it. We look at Alamance County's full ranges. So we look at the minimum, midpoint, and maximum. I'll just point you to that shift supervisor in central communications, that third one down, or fourth one down. So right now, the uh, current minimum salary for that position is $46,600. $617, um, and market is telling us that's closer to $51,692, or market is currently 10.9% higher than Alamance County. Blue, market is higher. Red, market is lower. And that's normal. Each year we see red and blue arrows because we're reviewing each of the positions on a three-year cycle been a while since we evaluated the positions and so we want to make sure that we're looking at what's moving very quickly in the market right now and what may, what may need some more adjustment to keep, keep competitive. And then those averages that I mentioned, the 4.2 at minimum, 1.8 at the midpoint and 0.1 at the maximum, those are on average of all of these positions. So when we are placing a position into a grade, we're not looking at the person in the role at all. Again, this is position-based. The goal of that is we may have an employee that is very valuable to the county. They've spent a long time in the position. They're a great high-performing employee. But the reason why we look at positions is because if that employee wins the lottery next week and they're out of here, the position still exists. We need to understand what is the value of that position. So we don't look at the person in the role. We're not looking at performance. We're not looking at their length of service. We're not even looking at their existing salary. When we're making a recommendation for a grade assignment, it's based on the position. Supervisor subordinate separation, does the career progression make sense, and then driven a lot right now by the market midpoints. What on mark is on average paying for these roles. So we looked at the preliminary grade assignments. They were reviewed by the county's project team, and we also reviewed these with leaders last week. So one of the things, once we have those grade assignments formed, we do look at then the implementation scenarios. So where are people falling within these ranges? How do we make the commitment to continue to move people towards their market value for a position? Currently, a large portion of the employees, about 415 of them, or 39% of the entire workforce of Alamance County, have been in their position, their current position, for a year or less, which means they've been promoted to a new position relatively soon, or they've just newly been hired. So about, again, 39% of your uh, workforce right now is um, just within a year or less of their position. And then the majority of the employees... So position, not hire. That's correct. <coughs> yeah, so they might have been newly promoted. They might have been with the county for 15 years but made manager last year. We're looking at where are they at within their manager position range, which if we've developed well-developed career progressions, as the county has done, um, people are consistently moving forward in those roles. The majority of full-time employees are falling within the lower half of their pay ranges, meaning somewhere between minimum and midpoint, midpoint being that 50% or that halfway <coughs> point between the minimum and maximum, which if we have a good majority of the people in those positions only within their position for a year or less, being in the early part of the range makes sense. So this data is tracking with movement of employees within those ranges as well. But we need to make sure that we have an annual movement within the range that keeps salaries competitive. It's going to incentivize employees to stay. That way we reduce turnover <coughs> as well. We don't want people just sitting in one role and then never making progress within that pay range. So regular adjustments like we continue to do every year based on tenure, based on performance. You're doing uh, regular COLA adjustments. Um, you're looking at performance each year as well. So people are making <coughs> progress through those ranges. Pay policies in Alamance County are working quite well. So this is what we look at in terms of the implementation scenarios. The calculations that we do are reflective of base pay only. So this is not inclusive, inclusive of total compensation in terms of benefits or um, <coughs> any additional salary components um, or, or pay, supplemental pay practices. 
Um, Baker Tilly does not recommend a pay decrease for any employee as a result of the study. It's just in our compensation philosophy. But again, because we're not looking at the person in the role, we're not evaluating performance or giving credit for the, any of those tenure components. So that's not what we're looking at here. It's about the position um, and is the p position paid competitively. So the implementation scenarios, we prepared two of them. Now that we have a new range for the position, we look at the employee's current salary and we say, where are you at in relation to that new minimum? If you're below, what does it take to get you at least up to that new minimum? Um, all other employees within that range are now uh, appropriately placed and so they retain their existing salaries. This is just to get everybody onto the pay structure and in the correct grade assignment. So, but the challenge with option one is that say a position has moved up a grade because that's what market is indicating. Now everybody that is within that role, if they're less than that new starting minimum, they're all starting at the minimum. And they're all at the same starting point, whether they've been there for five minutes or five years. So the option two is meant to build in some of that additional separation back in. Where should they be given this individual has one year of experience within the role, this one has five years of experience within the role, somebody else has eight years of experience within the role. We want to build in some additional separation, which is what option two is meant to look at. And then so overall, our recommendations are to approve the proposed pay plan and adjustments to the position grade assignments, adopting an implementation scenario that's going to address and meet our compensation philosophy as well as our business goals, one that is fiscally attainable and sustainable over time. And then we'll just continue to do efforts exactly like these. So mainly reviewing the classification and compensation system, moving forward, reviewing the next third of positions um, next year, which will complete our three-year cycle. Um, from there, we can reevaluate, are these peers the right peers that we need to be looking at? Um, what positions are carried to market each year? But we wanna get through this three-year cycle, making sure all of the positions are competitive. And then one of the other recommendations I do make is that um, Alamance County right now look at some kind of form of uh, internal equity component. Right now, the only metric for determining grade assignments is external, what the market is paying. Um, it would be great to understand how the positions within the county compare to each other. How do these two managers compare, even though they sit in very different parts of the county doing different work? Not all managers are treated or created equal. Some have higher education and experience requirements. Some supervise more people. Right now, we don't have a mechanism for understanding internal equity. Um, and as I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, internal equity is a component of determining pay for employees. And so that is something that I re highly recommend Alamance County look at in the future. And with that, I'll answer any questions anyone has. Mr. Turner, we're still on the opposite end. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, trying to organize these questions. Um, sure. Starting with your assumptions for your market analysis, do you include assumptions about merit pay either for Alamance County employees or the the other counties that you're looking at? We do not because we're just looking at base pay when we're comparing what is the base pay of Alamance County's positions in comparison to base pay of your peer organizations. The market study isn't looking at other mechanisms of pay, including merit. So it's not something that we're taking into consideration. And not benefits either. Not benefits either, no. Which departments did you analyze in this round? We looked at central communications, inspection, health, um, planning, and sheriff's department. I want to say there was one more. Cheryl, may help me out. Landfill. 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 We looked at just the sheriffs. We looked at um, just the deputy side. Patrol. The, sheriff, yes. the sworn so, positions. Because we looked at detention last detention year. Detention correct. Last year, correct. Your, uh, um, family Justice Center was involved. Dental Would you repeat that for the audience? That sure. You know, she also had de uh, dental clinic and um, family justice center were also a part of this project, this go around. Thank you. Um, part of your market analysis, do you, did you look at whether the pay for each of the comparators was sufficient? to fill vacancies in those comparators? 
No, so we're not looking at vacancy rates of the peer organizations either. We are capturing some of that by looking at the cost of labor. Some of that metric that we use from the Economic Research Institute is looking at their rate of unemployment and their ability to have qualified laborers for those positions. The idea there is that uh, each organization is looking at how labor or living cost of living is changing year over year and making adjustments to their salary structure, just like you do, with that in mind. Some organizations are better about keeping pace with that cost of labor rising. Um, others are, are lagging behind. So if you didn't include that, is, is an assumption in your work that if a county is at market, then they should be filling their vacancies? Yes. So this is looking at overall on the average. So we're not right. singling one out or the other. It's a law of averages that right. we work on. But what is that average market rate for the positions? If 15 of your peer organizations are paying near or at that market average, then everybody should be competitive in what that looks like. So if, if there are instances, for instance, with hard to fill positions within the county, yeah. such that your assumption no longer holds for those positions, do, do you account for in your model uh, a carve out for hard to fill? So one of the things that we look at in our initial assessments is understanding when was the last time a position was evaluated. Because we're on this three year cycle, positions move annually, um, but some positions kind of stay pretty steady and consistent over time. And so where we indicate hard to fill or hard um, to retain positions as well is in that initial assessment, where has there been significant turnover within Alamance County recently? And how can we take a closer eye to what is that true market value for that position? So we are maintaining competitiveness. Um, let me ask it maybe a different way. Are there instances where some counties will choose, if you go back to your market philosophy, lead, lag, or, or, may, or match, reach, yeah. or meet, match. Do you ever have counties where for some positions they wish to lead and for other positions you wish to match? Certainly. Um, you take an overall on the average of what that market philosophy is, and that's going to matter for the majority of your positions. But you'll also see some organizations that have an entirely separate pay structure for different employee groups. So they might have um, EMS or sheriff on a completely separate pay structure. The idea there is to adjust and move that. Right now, Alamance County is one compensation philosophy for all of the positions. And because we don't have that component for internal equity, if we're just choosing to lead on a handful of positions, it may end up challenging internal equity of positions as well. So these are doing very similar work, but we don't have pay parity because market says this one needs to be higher. If we had a good adjustment for understanding how the positions compare internally, that would be easier. One thing that we're not capturing here for a number of reasons, um, I'm not faulting your work, I'm just saying philosophically we're not capturing uh, an issue that's, I think, prevalent here, which is we have DSS social workers who we've had significant holes for a, a number of years. Even though we hit those those folks last year in our market study, that's not having an impact. Um, so I don't know that this, because it doesn't look at those people and because we're not this model doesn't account for in and of itself hard to fill positions. It's still a gap that we're not meeting as a county. And I'm not sure how to get there, but I do think we need to continue to look at that because it's it's a pervasive problem that we're not fixing. Yeah. We still have 11 positions open. Those haven't moved. So I'd like us to think about that a little bit. Um, can Maybe I for the next next meeting? Yeah, and I can have I a speak to that? Questions. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. one of the challenges that you currently have in the Alamance County Pay Plan, as it's designed, is that we have to make sure that you're in compliance with the Office of State Personnel for social service and health positions. That includes your social workers and public health nurses. Um, and so. The state dictates what that um, distance is between career progressions or supervisors and subordinates. And so as we look at the market, several of your peers are also bound by those same state policies. Nobody's willing to kind of move the needle yet because it has that accordion effect. You move the bottom entry level position, state is going to dictate where level two, level three, and the supervisor go. So everything needs to adjust. It becomes very costly to implement 
not just one position movement, but because we have to have um, equ standard equivalency on those positions to be in compliance with state uh, regulation, we have to make sure that you're staying in compliance. And so nobody's willing to move that adjustment yet. But that's certainly well, something that we'll take some a have, um, at least adjusted their salaries to make it more attractive to, to folks who are coming into the market. Yes. They, and if they don't have, if they have that exemption, they're able to do that easier. So it's just applying for state exemption and making sure that you don't have to abide by that state rule, which I can tell you that state rule is not written by a comp person. It's just <laughs> two, two grades. And so that becomes very challenging. But right now we have to make sure that you're in compliance with that. It's a report that you submit every July. So. So do you so you recommending one of two options? Is that right? Correct. And do you have a dollar figure for each of those options? I do. So we can get through. I might have to do some of my unhidden slides if I can do that piece. Yeah. Hidden slides? I do. Here you go. If you can go to 15 for me, please. Okay. So this is the. Mm -hmm. I'll get there. <laughs> All good. Let's go from there. So this is the implementation scenarios, option one and option two. I know that that's teeny tiny right now on the screen. So option one, again, is just that reminder of move to minimum. The cost for that is $126,000. That's an annual rate. Um, and then option two is that adjustment that we give credit for their time and position. Where should they be within that range? The cost for that is roughly $336,000. Um, and that uh, is accounting for the full annual component. So for mid-year implementation for a, a January 1, these would be half these amounts. And that's just... Um for these 111 positions? That's to recalibrate the entire pay structure um, and making sure that the positions are competitive. In our review, we had about 47 of the positions that needed to change their current values, which is about 13% of all of the positions that we evaluated. But this is looking at the full staff. Are both options looking at the full staff? Correct. So you're extrapolating the needs of all of the organization based upon the, the look at these 118? Correct. Yeah, what adjustments do we need to make to the overall pay structure based on the positions or the third of positions that we carried to market? We make those adjustments now where the positions need to go in terms of that competitiveness. So some positions, again, move at different rates. They don't need to be held at right now where they are is like a 113. They need to be at a 114 is more competitive for that rate. Every year of the study. Every year of the study. Okay, I'm all, that's all for now. I mean... Mm -hmm. Come back as I think about that a little bit more. Sure. Okay. Ms. Thompson. Um, does your study by any chance have a hint of our departments if they are overpopulated in staff or underpopulated in staff? We do not because we're not looking at uh, workforce or workload, so we're not okay. looking at any of that kinds of components. Okay. And like Craig was referring to um, about DSS. They were last study, right? Correct. They were included last year. Okay. If I can, not the Kansas on the spot, are you seeing a difference in your overall come work for me, you know, situation? Okay. I know the I know the the business of social work so difficult and um and it's county to county. We keep taking this county to give to that county. It's it's just, you know, I'm just I'm just curious because I know when I was on board first year as here, the vacancies were. Just, I thought, how are you open? <laughs> I mean, it was so much and just the, the stress lay on somebody in a department having to do multiple jobs because, yeah. Well, and if I may, please I just say that there's a lack of social workers out there right. at this particular time. So there's less people going into the field of social work, and if they are. They're wanting to do more of a clinical side mm -hmm. of social work and not necessarily the DSS. So I won't wholeheartedly say that the change wasn't impactful, right? We did see some increases in applications, but then we're starting to see that trail off again, um, whether it be the holidays are here or just simply there's a lack of people going into the work. Well, I mean, everybody has the right to decide what to do and what kind of salary they want to make, but um, that's such a needed position in the school system as well as just at DSS. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. You might want to indicate, I saw a head nodding. 
with Ms. Thompson's question, but that did not translate into the audience. Uh, Are you asking your me? Your question was, with DSS and their study last year, mm -hmm. did the salary increases impact retention? Is, it, is that your question? Sort of. Well, we still have high vacancies yeah. at DSS, unfortunately. Um, I have to keep thinking about this study and that what it is looking at is the structure of our pay, the minimum, midpoint, and maximum. So at the end of the study, we can say, yes, our pay structure is competitive with our benchmark peers. But what we're seeing in job offers of actual employees is that our benchmark peers are not making offers at the minimum or midpoint. Right, they are bringing in employees very high in their pay scale, and so we're still facing that competitive challenge, is that there is such a high demand for employees who are doing the kind of work that we do in county government, that although our pay structure is competitive, the market, what we're seeing in terms of job offers is really shocking. Have yeah. we identified? Like, this doesn't look at actual pay. It looks at our pay structure. It doesn't look at actual pay until we're deciding whether or not that person needs an adjustment. It's looking more at the, the structure. That's correct. Have we identified who the, for lack of a better term, the culprits <laughs> might be? It is <laughs> Attracting everybody. people from, that are trying to pull people away from us? We know county, we or? know in the past that it's been some of the bigger counties, the Guilfords and the Durhams and the Wakes, right. but I can tell you anecdotally that the smaller I'm counties have really upped their games, and we're seeing employees get offers that are staggering. Thank you. Which will affect your work going forward, but not in this moment. Correct. Well, no matter where your county line is or your state line, you got abuse and violence everywhere. And um, these jobs with some law enforcement, yeah. anybody that's doing face-to-face, -face, really hardcore, difficult stuff, people are not running to them. They're running from them. Um, some of these jobs have a target on their back, which is unwarranted. Um, it, it's, it's just unbelievable the level of um, what we're facing now. I had somebody tell me a long time ago that every person needs their own police officer. <laughs> And I'm starting to wonder about that because um, we see with just, just everything seems to just be, it's a time of hot messes because um, so many areas of we're just failing in society. And we see that in your own people, we see it everywhere. And we just can't get ahead of it. Can't pay your way out of it, but you gotta pay people a good wage to do this kind of work because it is hard. It is, hard. It is so hard. I don't think you can ever pay anybody enough money to do these kind of jobs. Um, because of what goes along with it, you know? You wake up the next day and you still got that in your head. It just doesn't stop when you go home. So. Mr. Lashley. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Town, thank you for your presentation. Uh, quite fascinating. Um, thank you. I also like the fact that, Heidi, that you mentioned what, what we see and some of the things that we're encountering um, that uh, the, the cost of labor is screaming higher. And it's like not just the low positions. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really certain what, I'm, <laughs> I'm not really certain what you do here. Um, I, I, I think it was very interesting you mentioned the, the state of North Carolina um, and some of their things with DSS, the accordion effect. Yep. Um, I'm just going to ask a question off the cuff because it's the first thing that comes to my head. Is there anything that we could do on through our state representatives to see if there's something that they could uh, do for us? So to, about, uh, sort of I'd say half of the counties that are on this list are also bound by that same state exemption. Yep. And so getting rid of that would make a lot more freedom and flexibility for counties to be able to be competitive with market to be able to retain and even recruit to hard to fill positions. But then we positions might be in the back, back in the same situation that we are now if that was to occur. 
That's why one of the pieces that I am recommending is that internal equity is because right now you're just at the whim of market and market for certain positions has been screaming for the past 24 months as we've conducted various market studies across North Carolina. It's they're hard to fill, they're hot jobs. And so there's been a lot of competition for talent around those types of positions. But having an internal equity component is like the skeleton of your pay structure. And market doesn't care about a supervisor subordinate separation. It doesn't really look at career progression. It's gonna say, this is the value of this position this year. The next year it could go up by 10%, the year following it's 2% but you adjusting the salaries each and every single year just at the whim of market is what could be costly in the long term. Having that sense of internal equity of how these positions, how those two managers compare to each other and how they adjust each year is more sustainable over time. Thank you. Mr. Hoare. You are you, it sounded like you might be recommending multiple, a multiple tiered plan for for example, one plan for the Sheriff's Department, another plan for DSS, and another? Not at this time, no. So we still are proposing one general pay structure for all of Alamance County. Because you are in compliance and need to be in compliance with state law, having everybody all in one pay structure makes the most sense for a unified compensation philosophy for all of your positions. But we've been in a situation with the Sheriff's Office for, as best I can recall, at least three years where we've been down between 40 and 50 staff. DSS has been down every year. EMS has been down every year. We're not able to fill these positions with the current plan, it doesn't appear. I don't know, I'm just kind of struggling with, you know, how do we come up with a plan where we can, can find a way to fill positions so that we can't, aren't constantly playing catch-up ball with keeping people out there to take care of our citizens. Yeah, the, you're already doing the right steps, so I'll reassure you with that piece. Doing a third, a third, a third on a three-year cycle evaluating the positions is what many of your peer organizations are doing as well. Once that full third cycle is done, we can then start to understand how is the overall structure need to change? Are these peers even are our peers anymore? What is that movement of employees within the market space? So after the three-year cycle is that reevaluation time. What can we do differently to make sure that we are still competitive? Adjusting the structure each year is also helping, maintaining the competitive pace. But our goal right now is a match market philosophy. If the goal is in the county in the future to lead market, that may also help some of those components. Right now it's a 100% match at that midpoint. If we're wanting to be competitive and you want to say, look, we've looked at these 15 peer organizations, we want to lead by 3%, by 5%. Even just that incremental difference can make a, a huge difference in terms of the competitiveness of your salaries. So if we were to look at a lead perspective mm -hmm. at a 3%, hypothetically, what would be the, do you have any insight into what that impact might be? I don't have it right now. So as we looked at developing the compensation philosophy, we're still sticking with this three-year cycle of a match market philosophy. Once that three-year cycle is over, just in terms of equity, then we can look at redefining our compensation philosophy. Again, that kind of first slide is what I want you to remember is like, it starts with compensation philosophy, then defining our market, then we go into the positions. Once we get through the three-year cycle, we can start to look at has our compensation philosophy changed? Are we no longer a match agency, but let's take a lead market philosophy and, and see what that looks Carter, like. We actually saw this firsthand when we were dealing with the Sheriff's Department. Sure. When we jumped up and actually went into lead, we started getting dozens. But it's got to be implemented yes. with a contract mm -hmm. that requires retention. Yeah, our contract with the Sheriff's Department, <coughs> both for officers, detention, and bailiffs, <coughs> require a two-year commitment. And without that, you're, in my opinion, just throwing money away. But with that two-year commitment, you have retention. Well, I guess one yeah. of my thoughts is if we, you know, if we look at a, that's, in that department is a lead. Yes. If we look at a lead philosophy versus a, um, Match. Match. What was it? A match philosophy. Match philosophy. Uh, and different levels of it, what would be the impact on the budget, I guess, is where I'm going. What, what are we looking at from a, a cost perspective if we, if we take a different philosophy and try to 
factor it into the budget. You know, is, is a lead philosophy with a 3% lead, going to, what impact would it have on our budget planning for next year? Where do we want to stay? Do we want to stay at match and be playing catch-up ball, or do we want to try and change where we're trying to go? And I think we logically look at that at budget time, not in the middle of the budget. Well, but now's the time to start talking about looking at it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I bring it up. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, we got one more of the three-year cycle um, to be able to evaluate the next third of positions and do the same process of evaluate what adjustments need to be made and where do the positions go and change. And then once that's kind of concluded, it's what can we do different on the next three-year cycle. I do have one last question. Just looking at that slide, that's, that's the slide that I'd like to concentrate on. Sure. Um, going forward uh, for the next part of our study. Uh, and to Susan, I just want to see if these numbers look right for you. I see a proposed salary of $64 million for 1,066 employees. That seems about right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we sat in a seat four years ago, that number was in the low 50s. Mm -hmm. So we have done a considerable amount toward this yeah. because this board's been focusing on this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think going forward, we need to focus on it a little more. And I think that if we focus on the proposed salary number um, to uh, sort of answer what Commissioner Carter was, where he was going, that this is a number that you could focus on going forward to see how we're doing right. on the lead part. Um, and you may actually want to uh, focus on that number going forward in the next budget to see if we're making any headway. Like that 64 number, you know, if it's 10% higher to get you to $70 million, I'm almost certain $6 million would be a considerable amount of money to address these issues that we're having with salaries from DSS to the Sheriff's Department down the road. I mean, because right. $6 million. And if it's any consolation to this board and to the citizens of Alamance County, we're in the process of reevaluating 76,000 parcels in the county that hadn't been done in 30 years. I think you're going to find a considerable amount of things that you didn't know you had, uh, and, and I think the tax Except revenue will come in to be able to address issues like this. Good point. Um, Ms. Carter, I totally agree. These slides were not presented to us in advance, were not in our packets and or provided. Can we have these slides? presented in a, on our web. <coughs> I think it's Absolutely. important that the citizens and county commissioners all see the numbers. Will that happen? Yes, it will. And Ms. Thank Town you. Baker Tilly did a wonderful job in this Definitely. presentation. It was very, very fascinating. Thank and I, I hope that the people in Alamance County will take a look at this uh, information because it's, it's a lot of information there that can answer a lot of questions that they may have. Yeah. Exactly. There's always questions about how people are paid, and one of the things of our team at Baker Tilly only does classification and compensation studies like this for local government entities, one of the only few agencies in the entire nation that do just focus on public sector. And I'm specifically located in North Carolina. I'm an App State grad. I sat on the faculty at UNC School of Government, so the fact that I can be here and impacting um, county government employees in the state of North Carolina with our work is our goal. We want to be able to make sure that transparency of how people are paid and why they are paid is not a mystery. It's not magic. It's a lot of math. Um, and so that's all it really is at the end of the day. Well, thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Any other questions from this board? I have a couple, Mr. Chairman. Oh, sure. um, Ms. York, what is budgeted this year for yeah. implementation of this? Thanks. We set aside or budgeted $400,000 for phase two implementation. So the numbers that Ms. Towns showed you were for one year. If you were to go with option two, that 336537 a January 1 implementation would cost you $168,268. And can you, Ms. Towns, can you just again describe in layman's terms what option two does for you? Sure. So I'll start with option one because it's predicated on that. So option one is that move to minimum. If an employee's current salary is less than the new proposed minimum, 
Option one is just getting them to that new minimum. But now you have all these employees that are at the same starting place at minimum, whether they've been here for five minutes or five years. So option two looks at how long they've been in the role, years in position, and does a calculation from that new minimum, where should they be within that range given a set percentage adjustment. This is a 2% per year in position from the minimum. And if their salary is less than that, they get the adjustment. If their salary is more than that, they're already appropriately placed within the range, they retain their existing salary. Again, we're not reducing salaries to, to match. So we're, we're looking at just a 2% per year in position from that starting minimum, and then looking at the employee's existing salary, where is it in relation to that new figure. Okay, and then I know we're not, voting on this today, but this internal analysis that you recommended, sure. is that, do you do that for the entire organization at the same time? Yes, we do, because you're looking at comparing all of the positions in the organization to each other. It's a one straight shot of what we look at in terms of classification. So this is just a market study, compensation market study. We also do classification at Baker Tilly, yep. and it's all positions in the organization. You have a sense of of potential budget impact for that analysis? Not off the hand, but I've been requested it from uh, HR and the administration, so I'm working on preparing those figures. I mean, would you anticipate it's, I mean, the last two times we've done this, it's been a, a pretty in incremental increase. It's not been a, um, a, an exponential increase. Right. Do you have a sense of, if you if you do the internal analysis compared to what you've done here, is it, a, do you anticipate it would be a bigger budgetary imp uh, impact then for some positions clients. because it's about that internal equity component not what market is saying for the position we also look this is it's in conjunction so we look at market how does the market sh shift the structure each year based on our overall compensation philosophy we look at then of like is it a match or is it a lead that's where the structure comes in internally when we're looking at internal equity is how do these two positions that are doing very similar work compared to each other and should there be any kind of adjustment made to those salaries. So the impact overall to implement internal equity is negligible, but it does impact positions. It makes them more sustainable over time. Okay. They're not as subjected to market conditions and the whims of market. And let me suggest that to answer Mr. Carter's mm -hmm. question and, and following up on Mr. Lassie's comments about lead lag, I think it makes perfect sense for the county to have a hybrid philosophy, which is to lead hard to fill and to meet the remainder. I mean, that, that is answering the market. This is a piece of it, but, but that answers those hard to fill positions perhaps, and maybe a way to determine whether in the next budget cycle we need to look at that. Perhaps we could, we could offer some kind of bonus program similar to the sheriff's program for DSS and to see if that has an impact this year such that we it will inform next year whether we need to continue to look at those pieces or not and i'm not suggesting a vote on that in this moment but maybe we get some uh, maybe a recommendation for the next meeting on that um, i agree, I agree. And i just want to make a point that uh <coughs> Chairman paisley's got he really put it pretty much put the uh the reason why we were able to do that with the sheriff is yeah. that contractual obligation yeah. hold them there for that two-year period, so we don't get what Miss Town was talking about. It's like someone comes, takes the position, and then right. goes away. So that may be that may be the, the fulcrum that you're looking for maybe. to to move it, move the move the needle a little bit, and maybe from DSS, if you know what what you think your employees coming in, what would sign a two-year contract to stay with you during that time? You know, things like questions like that you probably have to answer as we go forward to see if that's possible. But I like I like how you're thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, just sure. curious. We did bonuses for DSS. I'm, I would like to know how many people have stayed that received those bonuses, how that works. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Turner, were you saying you wanted a discussion about sign-on bonuses for the next meeting? Yeah, maybe for next meeting. Yes, yeah, so a recommendation or something to see if that, if that would impact. I, I, think it, I think it would give information on next budget cycle and you may not have to lead next budget cycle in these if um if bonuses fix it i don't know okay so on this particular study on the market study you have two options that we need some direction on which one you'd like to implement as of january one and what amount of money we're authorized to spend there's 
potential <laughs> that some, uh, because this is a snapshot of salaries, that there may be some changes between now and the January 1 implementation date. So it might be helpful to authorize us to spend up to 200000 so that we can fine-tune some of the movements that may not be accounted for in the, the current version of the study as we go forward. We also presented with department heads last week, and there are some cleanup issues that we have where maybe we captured um, the salary that, that we used in last year's, and they've moved with Merit, they've moved with COLA. So we need some fine-tuning. So I think we would like the ability to make some of those fine-tuning adjustments and do a little bit of cleanup, make sure that all of our grades are accurately reflected for that January 1 implementation. That was my next question. What is your recommendation as county manager? I think we like option two. It is consistent with what you did for your phase one employees where you took into account years of service in the position. It helps address some of that compression issue. We don't want to go with option one and then create more issues that we need to address later. Right. So I think we like option two with some additional funds and not have to come back um, so that we can clean up some of the issues that we identified with our department directors. And is that 200000 the recommended amount? That's our recommended amount. That's half of what you had budgeted, so you will still have a nice savings um, going forward in that. Um. Yeah, I'll make a motion for okay. that. I do have, I have a question on that, too. Okay. Uh, you want to go first? Uh, I, I think we both may have the same question. Right. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you, the, the 336 is for implementation, and we budgeted four, and that's for... Yes. This is for the for annual. This is for a full year. So, so a mid-year January is half of that Mid-year would be that... That's the 168, 268, I... Quoted 168 is dividing that in half and then add 200 to it which is still under the 400 you're saying or I'm just saying it, it's 168 if we if you authorize us to spend up to 200 that would give us a bit of room to do some of the cleanup adjustments that we may need going and we can always modify that later right. correct well my question's a little bit more focused okay um, the two hundred thousand dollars that you're talking about is that for the 118 employees for this phase? So you're basically looking at, I don't know, right at $2,000 an employee if you were doing it by an average? No. no. So this is looking at the full staff. So this so is oh, 10, This is option two impacts yeah. all 1,066 county employees. Does everybody get an increase? No, it is based off of that adjustment to the 111 positions that we looked at in market and what positions are changing. If they're below, they're moving to the minimum. If they're within, are we accounting for their years in position and giving them credit for that? Understood. And, and, I, uh, and I agree. this funding is coming from where? This is a separate amount we set aside just for implementation of this study. Okay, and you, I asked her this, and I'll ask you as our county manager, are you able to tell what departments we might be overpopulated in or underpopulated in as far as is our staff too heavy or is our staff too short? We can only do that by comparing ourselves right. to other, so I would need to do that sort of study. Okay. I would need to look at our staffing levels and compare those to some peers. Okay. Now that you and I have already talked about that issue, overpopulation hunter and so forth and to some degree you're already looking at these numbers we have looked at that for some departments we also receive some um, guidance <clears throat> from the state particularly in dss and public health including environmental health in terms of caseload measures and how many uh, cases each employee should be handling according to the guidelines that the state provides to us and I can say with much assurance that our caseloads far exceed what the state recommends or um, states that you're supposed to be handling as an individual employee. It's always funny how people who are way far away and don't work that work right. don't get it. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah, again, my motion is that we take the county manager's recommendation do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? Option two, right. 
Option two. Well, option two and with authorize the, up to 200000 for the implementation of phase two. Correct. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate your good work as always. Okay, county attorney. Nothing for me to do today, board. Thank you. Best speech tonight. <laughs> today. Okay, county manager. Nothing for me. Thank you. Second best. <laughs> okay. County commissioners, Ms. Thompson. Just to follow up, um, I had to do some work with a client that I have that found us at Celebrate Recovery, and I went to the diversion center myself Friday to ask questions about how to get the path going for this young man and um, was met with nothing but professionalism, but our children's wing is not open and neither is our 16-bed unit because I know about licensure, and I'm just curious as to when this diversion center is going to be full-blown open. That's all. <laughs> and I have the same question, by the way, too. Okay. But it's not your turn yet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Turner. <laughs> Nothing from me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lashley. Uh, uh, actually, I just wanted to say that, that um, everybody knows tomorrow's election day. If you want to uh, have a voice in your county government, tomorrow's the day to make it happen. And I encourage everyone to get out and vote. Mr. And I had not, yes, I had not finished my questions. I was curious. Sheriff, where we are, uh, you hadn't made any comments up in the last week or two from any sources on where we are with any new additions. I know about two weeks ago, I think we were up about 14, I think it was, yeah. in applications. We, uh, <clears throat> we're getting ready to swear in, plus, I think it was this morning, 20, just wanted to be able to be 20-something. 20-something. Wow. Wonderful. Now, is that... What what's the mix, uh, deputies and detention? And deputies. Do we know what the numbers look like for detention? What that'll bring us Sir, to? Sir, I'm not exact, but I think it's something like ten detention positions. There. So that'll bring you down to around thirty detention vacancies then. Yes, sir. And so the other ten then would be deputies, and that would just about get us where we need I to think be. This morning we had a total of fifty-one or fifty-two positions still open, but. That's not counting the people that's going to be sworn in. Uh, so about 30 vacancies in. This is, yes, sounds like it's working good. Okay, it's work, it's great. Beg your pardon? It's working excellent. Sure. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm overwhelmed that it, I knew it would work, but I didn't think it would work this good. We're, you know, it's killing our people. We're having to do the backgrounds, <laughs> the, the mental health evaluations, drug testing, and all that stuff. And all that stuff. Nice way to be killed, right? No, <laughs> nice no, way to be killed, no, right? No, yes. no, no. no wrong word. Working work. today. That was not fun. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. Nice problem to have. Yes. That sounds yes. bad. It is. Well, he said it was killing his people. We don't so. talk killing. If you got to be killed, that's one way to be killed, right? Card, you keep digging that hole, Steve. Yeah, you need to get, get rid of your shovel. The hole got deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Lashley, we do have some uh, election updated numbers if you would like us to share oh, those yes. this morning. Absolutely. Sure. Bruce, I think you have those from our elections director. Yes, yeah, so, so far, um, they 65,000 people have voted early, um, and then another 4,500 by tomorrow have mailed in. That's almost 70,000. Wow. Uh, the last presidential election, uh, election was around 89,000 total. We'll probably wow. beat that record. Nice. So this is, you know, a lot of people have voted early. Every day has been a record on early voting. But I think again, every, every uh, presidential election is, is a record. Yeah. And, of course, we're increasing in size. So they think it will be just shy of 100,000 uh, total at the end of the day. So... Uh, all that will be posted online, whatever, tomorrow night. So, thanks and for the Mr. update. Mr. Walker, I think there are only like 119, 120,000 yeah. registered voters. Mm -hmm. So that gives you some uh, indication. It's a very high percentage, which, yeah. again, that's people doing their civic duty. So. Absolutely. Well, I get some analytical reports, too, separately on the county by 
precinct, and there are a number of precincts where people who have regularly voted have not voted yet. Large numbers in some of the precincts that are more remote haven't come into the early voting locations, and so there should be a really good turnout this year. And a very, very high number of same-day registration and voting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been very, very positive, I think, for the entire county. Um, the county will be, hopefully, the officials that the county wants will be in place after this vote with so many people. I would encourage everybody, if you've never registered to vote, please do so. Uh, my wife was out campaigning over this past week at one of the early voting precincts. Gentleman, 57 years of age, indicated he had never voted before. Wow. <laughs> voted this time. So, and a number of people that were really interested in gaining information, which is even better. You're not just voting, you're voting with an, an informed voter. And that's essential. So if you haven't voted, I agree with everybody on this board, vote. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thanks Any motion? Update, yeah. Any motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying I am aye. 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 I like that. <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.local.gov.com tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.